In this tutorial, we will cover three items, translational lift, basic takeoff, and basic landing. Understanding the physics of translational lift is key to takeoff and landings with any helicopter in DCS world. First, we'll cover translational lift. And because I like to keep things as basic as possible to make them easily understandable for me to interpret, I won't go into the physics of translational lift, but instead, I'll use an example to help you visualize what translational lift is and why it occurs. So imagine a Harrier hovering in place. In order for that Harrier to transition from hover to flight, it relies on two factors to make that transition. The first factor is the direction of the airflow for thrust, and the second is its wings. Thus, for the Harrier to make that hover to flight transition, it must direct its thrust rearward to begin pushing itself forward and then rely on speed for the wings to take over for the transition from hover to flight. All helicopters act very similar in their own way. To achieve that hover to lift transition in a helicopter, the pilot must change the direction of the airflow rearward by tilting the cyclet forward, and upon reaching about 20 or 30 knots depending on the weight or weather, the air passing over and through the blades of the rotor system changes the flight characteristics of the rotor blades, and they begin to act more like wings rather than a simple large fan. This is the sole reason that neither a Harrier or a helicopter can make immediate or instantaneous transitions from hover to flight, or from flight to hover, for you are trading one with the other. And in order to obey the laws of physics, the transition from hover to flight, or vice versa, must be done in a trade-off, or in a transition, hence the word translational in the term translational lift, as you need to transition from one state to another. The reason I emphasize this prior to covering how to take off and land is due to the common misconception that helicopters are only achieving their airborne state because they are simply pushing air downwards. However, this is not entirely true. Just like the Harrier example earlier, it's only during hovering when the helicopter is pushing air downwards to keep it aloft. Otherwise, when speed is added into the mix, translational lift takes over, and the blades of the helicopter begin to act like wings, much like the Harrier's wings when higher speeds are introduced. The irony from this is that you want to fly a helicopter less like a helicopter and more like a plane by understanding both takeoffs and landings need their own room for an invisible runway to gain or bleed speed. While obviously there's plenty of differences between the two, they're similar enough that if you keep this in mind, it helps you visualize and understand the capabilities of what a helicopter can do to avoid overly aggressive takeoff or landing maneuvers that exceed the limits of the aircraft. Multiple factors are to be considered to determine how quickly you can accelerate or decelerate to enter and exit translational lift without losing control. But much like driving your car, it's very easy to get a feel for it. And just like your car, the weight, engine power, acceleration input, or collective input in this case, steering control, or cyclic control, and weather conditions will all determine the limitations of how quickly and effectively you can make this transition. The more you practice the basics by remaining slow and smooth, the more you'll learn the limits of the aircraft without losing control. Thus for now, this takeoff and landing tutorial will cover the basics of those maneuvers, and in a later video, we'll go into more advanced and aggressive maneuvers for landing and takeoff. First, let's cover a basic takeoff to make that transition from hover to flight. To make this easy on you to provide you with the most room for error, I'd recommend going into the mission editor and then select the helicopter. Then place it at the end of a runway. Now select the UH-1H and make sure that you select the player from the drop-down list. Now select Takeoff from Ground Hot and change the direction you'd like to be pointing. Then go into the Munitions page and uncheck the external hardpoints 
and drag the fuel load to 50%. Finally, you can choose whatever paint scheme you'd like. This will provide you with a significantly more power and maneuverability that would be much more forgiving due to the lesser weight of the aircraft along without having to adjust for wind. Now that we're on the ground, let's go over exactly what the collective does. Collective pitch simply changes the angle of the blades to increase or decrease the air being pushed downwards by the blades. Increasing the collective pushes more air downwards and decreasing the collective reduces the air it pushes downwards. While it sounds simple in theory, it's important to remember that each blade weighs almost 200 pounds traveling at about 6 rotations every second, or about 325 RPM. The slight changes in their angle of attack can significantly increase or decrease the demand of the engine. In a simple analogy, imagine holding your hand flat out of the window of a car while traveling at 60 miles an hour. This would be your collective at zero. But once you tilt your hand upwards to catch more air, the amount of strength required to keep your arm straight increases drastically, which would be the maximum collective. The same exact physics are occurring on a helicopter blade as you increase collective, hence why it's important not to employ too much collective that is more than the engine can handle. The best way to tell how much strain is being placed on the engine is to keep a sharp eye on your exhaust gauge any time you increase the collective. The lighter you are, the less collective pitch will be required to keep the aircraft airborne, thus leading to less strain on the engine. In the prior analogy, imagine your hand out of the window of the car and you only pitch it up just a bit. It won't be hard to keep your arm straight. However, the heavier you are, the more collective pitch will be required on the blades to lift the additional weight, leading to more strain on the engine. In this case, imagine placing your hand nearly straight up and down out of the window of the car, and now it's significantly more difficult to keep your arm straight out. It's imperative that you keep the strain of the engine to a minimum and in the green. If you reach yellow, you are straining the engine, however small amounts of time here will do no damage. However, if you exceed the red line, 10 to 20 seconds in the zone is enough to permanently damage the engine performance. Furthermore, if you continue to remain in the zone, you'll overheat the engine and it'll catch fire. Now let's get into a hover and pay close attention to our exhaust gauge. Once we verify we're in the green, simply move the cyclic very slightly forward to pitch the nose down without adding any additional collective. Now that the blades are pushing the air rearward, the aircraft will begin to slowly move forward. As we maintain that movement, our speed will increase naturally without any additional collective. Upon reaching 20 to 30 knots, we will begin entering translational lift, transitioning into flight, which will cause slight turbulence, as noted by the shaking control panel. Once the turbulence has subsided, we're now in full translational lift, and your airspeed and your climb rate will drastically increase because the blades are now acting like a wing, providing lift to the entire aircraft. Now that translational lift has been achieved, the Huey is acting more like a fixed wing aircraft and less like a helicopter. In addition, because of the forward airflow now traveling around the airframe, it naturally pushes the tail of the aircraft to the right which means your hovering left pedal input will be significantly reduced. This basic takeoff technique is crucial if you're very heavy or slightly overweight as it requires no additional engine power or collective. As you can take advantage of hovering in the in-ground effect and then simply use the cyclic to gain momentum to enter that translational lift, which eases the burden from the blades which gives you a little bit more collective to play around with while you're in flight, but only when you're in flight. After practicing takeoff without adjusting the collective and you feel comfortable with it, you can then start to play around with increasing and decreasing the collective on takeoff to speed up this process. Just remember to keep an eye on your exhaust gauge. But I found it best to learn without touching the collective to get a grasp and understanding of the flight characteristics and limitations by just leaving it alone. This is an especially important skill to learn as once you begin adding more weight to the aircraft, 
or subject it to extreme climates or altitudes, these will cause you to have limited collective available to use. Thus, it's best to learn how to quickly get into translational lift without using a significant increase of collective, which will avoid an overall demand of the engine and exceeding its power and limitations when these additional factors are in play. That said, let's get into the different challenges that you'll face when adjusting your collective during takeoff. The two most important gauges during takeoff, aside from your exhaust gauge, is the vertical speed indicator and the forward speed gauge. These two play off each other, as when one is doing one thing, you can almost always ensure the other is doing the exact opposite. In other words, if you are increasing speed, you'll be losing altitude. And if you're gaining altitude, you'll be losing speed. It's really no different than to think of it as a car going up or downhill. If you're going down a hill, you'll be gaining speed and descending. If you're going up a hill, you'll be losing speed and ascending. So to balance these two, it's like driving a car. If you're ascending too fast, you'll be losing speed. Thus simply push the cyclic forward to give it more momentum which will solve both your ascent rate and your speed issue with one action. And if you're descending too fast, you'll be gaining speed. Thus simply pull back on the cyclic to slow down which will also decrease your rate of ascent. So to conclude this takeoff portion of this tutorial, let's recap in a single fluid action. First, get into an in-ground effect hover by increasing the collective and applying left pedal. Then slightly push the cyclic forward. Once the vibration begins, we're entering translational lift and need to prepare for the additional lift we're about to receive. Once we're in translational lift, we'll counter the lift with additional forward cyclic action, which will also gain us more speed. Now that we're in translational lift, oncoming air is pushing the tail to the right, which allows us to ease off our left pedal. Now slight left cyclic action is required to keep everything balanced and we're now in a stable forward flight. Landing is what most people find difficult, but you can master this technique just as easily as takeoff. If you keep everything in mind covered thus far regarding hovering in the previous video and takeoff and translational lift in this video. Just remember, as you must smoothly enter translational lift, you must also exit it smoothly as well. There's three actions that need to be completed to land a helicopter. The first is to bleed your speed in a controlled manner. The second is maintain control of a steady and smooth descent rate. And lastly, exit translational lift into a hover, utilizing the in-ground effect to assist you. Before we cover how to achieve these tasks, let's go over some of the physics of slowing down a helicopter and what can happen if you attempt to do this too quickly. As we're in flight, to bleed speed and lower our altitude to attempt a landing, we're going to lower the collective and simultaneously pull back on the cyclic. This upwards pitch, along with the added descent rate, appears to be achieving what we want. However, something just went very wrong. Notice we very quickly went from a steady descent rate of 500 feet per minute to over 1,000 feet per minute in less than a second. We've now entered what's called the vertical vortex ring. This effect only occurs when translational lift is not in effect. Because we're no longer in fast forward motion, or translational lift, the downwash from the blades is no longer being left behind us. Thus, we're attempting to descend too fast into our own downwash and right into the disturbed air below us. 
This causes the air coming from below the helicopter traveling upwards to actually overpower the downwash produced by the blades. Furthermore, the downwash is being pushed around the bottom half of the blades and getting sucked right back up into the top of the rotor system, causing a never-ending circulation effect, hence the vertical vortex ring. This cannot and should not ever be countered by increasing the collective. This is because you would just be feeding the circulation system, worsening the conditions already in play. I will cover the vertical vortex ring in detail in a later video, but for now, I will show you how to at least counter this, as this can be very common with being too aggressive, too aggressive on the landing. As soon as you've identified you're in the vertical vortex ring by hearing the increased rotor speed along with identifying the sudden loss of lift, aggressively push the cyclic to the right. Once a high bank rate has been achieved and you've moved away from the disturbed air, increase the collective. Finally, push the cyclic forward to regain translational lift if able. However, in this case, I pull back the cyclic gradually to lose altitude and regain my controls as I have enough altitude to utilize the in-ground effect to soften my emergency landing. Now let's look at that one more time without the interruptions. Now that we have that out the way, let's go back to focusing on landing. Again, going back to the three things that we need to achieve, let's tackle these one at a time to keep it simple. Realistically, we want to reduce the collective and pull back the cyclic almost at the same time. But instead, I'll do one at a time to give you an idea of the process. In addition, I'll make each action a bit more drastic to help you see what I'm doing. Our landing zone will be at the end of this runway. Our goal is to maintain a descent rate no more than 500 feet per minute while gradually slowing down but not exiting translational lift until we're closer to the ground by staying above 40 knots. I'm first going to lower the collective. In response, I'm going to pitch back just a bit to level my descent rate back to zero. Then I'm going to lower the collective again, and again respond by pitching back to bring my vertical speed to near zero. Now at 70 knots, I'm going to lower the collective again and pull back to zero my vertical speed. Then I'm going to lower the collective one more time and again pull back. Now that I'm at 40 knots, I don't want to go any lower and lose translational lift. So I'm going to leave the collective alone and only push forward on the cyclic as needed to keep above 30 knots. Notice I'm now losing altitude without any additional collective input. Everything is just cyclic now as I'm happy with my descent rate and can control my speed through the cyclic by pushing forward to gain speed and back to bleed speed.
At 70 feet above the ground, I can now start pulling back to bleed the speed and exit translational lift. As I exit this and enter a hover, left pedal, and very slight increase in collective is required. Now that we're in a hover, we can simply lower the collective and gently set her down. Now that you know how to land, let's cover how to pinpoint a place to land. A good indicator to help you pick a makeshift landing spot is the middle yellow strip to the right of the windshield. A good rule of thumb is if your landing zone is above the strip, then you don't need to slow your speed or lose altitude. Just keep pressing on until your landing zone is within the strip. If your landing zone is below the strip, then you are too close for a straight in landing. Let's pick this large taxi area to the left of the runway to land and use this yellow strip to help us. Just try to keep your landing area in the general area perpendicular to this strip but don't focus too hard on it. Landing is mostly about outside visual cues while taking quick glances at your speed and vertical speed indicator to verify your outside visual cues are correct. It's okay to increase the collective a bit if you see you're too low or too slow. As before, my descent rate will be around 500 feet per minute, and I don't want to go below 30 knots just yet and lose that translational lift as I'm still too high. But notice this time, I'll begin pulling back on the cyclic from a higher altitude than before, around 130 feet, and stay in a zone of being right on the edge of losing translational lift, but I won't pull back enough to lose it. Once the vibration begins, we'll be in that zone, and I'll pitch back slightly to stay in it and push forward so I don't lose it. It could be an effective way of slowing down or controlling your descent rate. And just as before, the in-ground effect will naturally slow us down, cushioning our landing. I'll provide two additional examples of staying on the borderline of translational lift. In this first example, we're going to stay low and fast. We're going to aim for the tire marks at the end of the runway. This is the first action I've taken to prepare for this landing. I've reduced the collective and pulled back on the cyclic to introduce pitch to slow down. Also take note of the yellow strip at the right. If you were to draw an imaginary line from that yellow strip over to my intended landing zone, it tells me that we're within the capabilities to make this landing. Here, I've reduced the collective even further, and I'm pulling back on the cyclic even more to increase my braking power. I've now slowed down from 85 knots to just under 70, so we're not at any risk of losing translational lift. Now that we're down to 40 knots, notice my collective input is almost completely down to zero. I'm also pitching back relatively aggressively. Because we're very close to exiting translational lift, if I were to maintain these exact inputs, we would no doubt crash into the ground. So because I know we're about to exit translational lift, I'm now going to add collective back in along with pushing the cyclic forward to prevent us from abu abruptly exiting translational lift.
I'll replay that one more time without the interruptions. Now we'll do the same thing again, but we're going to add a bit more altitude, which means a bit more aggression. Our landing zone for this case will be the end of the runway. I just made the first action to prepare for this landing. I've lowered the collective and began to slightly pull back on the cyclic. Again, notice our landing zone is within the yellow strip to the right of the windshield. I've now lowered the collective again and I'm pulling back more aggressively on the cyclic. Notice that the actions I've taken in this landing compared to our previous landing is much more aggressive. My collective is much lower versus the previous landing at this distance, and I'm pulled back on the cyclic more. This is because in the prior landing, we didn't have to worry about lowering our altitude, only decreasing our speed. However, in this landing, we need to do both, lower our altitude and decrease our speed, hence the more aggressive actions. Just like before, once you hit around 40 knots, you want to reintroduce collective as you're about to lose lift since you're exiting flight and entering a hover. You can see I've already introduced a bit of collective. And one more time without the interruptions. This concludes the tutorial for translational lift, takeoff, and landing. Remember, takeoffs and landings in a helicopter are almost identical to a Harrier. Both require a smooth trade-off of the transition from hover to flight and from flight to hover. As long as you can master this entrance and exit of translational lift, you'll be able to master takeoff and landings as this physical occurrence is the sole reason that both can be difficult, more so with landings. I hope this tutorial has been beneficial to those interested in flying helicopters in DCS World, and I look forward to bringing you future tutorials to further your knowledge and skills even more. Thank you for watching.